make music with the heavens, we will sing, sing, sing. Be grateful that you hear us when we shout your praise. Lift high the name of Jesus.
in the presence of my enemies. Louder than the unbelief. My weapon is a melody. Heaven comes to fight for me.
conviction. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection.
the Lord. If you're building upon Jesus Christ, you're building upon a firm foundation. If you're building upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you're building upon the rock of ages. And after everything is said and everything is done, he will still be standing. He is the first he is the last. He is he who was, who is, and who is to come. So if you're building upon him this morning, you're building upon a solid foundation. Slip your hands up to him this morning and just give him a praise. Will you do that? Oh, Lord, we honor you. Thank you, God, that you are never changing, that you are always the same, that you are consistent. In you there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, your word says. It means that you are always the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Who he was is who he is and who he will always be. He is good from the inside out. He is perfect. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Before you are seated this morning, Turn around and shake hands with someone that's nearby and let them know that you are glad that they are here in the house of the Lord today, all right? I thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
We welcome all of you that are here this morning. Thank you for being with us. Delighted to have you in the house of the Lord. How many of you have enjoyed a wonderful week? Anybody? I heard one faint amen. Today is, of course, the first Sunday after Easter, and I want to open this morning by just telling you a little story that I read the other day about a woman and her overbearing husband who had gone on vacation to the Holy Land. And while they were in the city of Jerusalem, the husband, unfortunately, he passed away. And the Jewish undertaker, he took the wife into his office and he told the wife, you can either have your husband's body sent back home at the cost of $500,000 or you can have him buried right here in the Holy Land for one hundred and fifty. dollars The woman thought about it for a few moments and then she told the undertaker, in spite of the exorbitant expense, I'm going to have him sent home. The funeral undertaker, he was set back by her answer, and he looked at her and he said, why would you spend that kind of money to ship your husband's body back home when it would be the opportunity of a lifetime to be buried right here in the Holy Land? And for 150 bucks, she said, well, you know, a long time ago, there was a man that died here in the city of Jerusalem and they buried him. And three days later, he came out of the grave. And I just can't afford to take that kind of risk. <laughs> Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Luke. So Luke chapter 24, and we're going to read two different texts this morning. I want to read Luke 24 and beginning with the 36th verse. And then I want to read from the book of John. But we're going to start with Luke 24, 36. And the Bible says, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. And he said unto them, Peace be unto you. And they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your heart? Get this. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit has not flesh and bone as you see me have. And when he had spoken these things unto them, he showed them his hands and his feet. And now I would like for you to turn with me to the book of John, chapter 20, and we're going to read beginning with verse 19. So John, chapter 20, the 19th verse. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and he stood in the midst of them and he said unto them, Peace be unto you. John is telling the same events that Luke shared with us. And when he had said these things, he showed them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw that it was the Lord. I'm going to quit reading right there. Ask that you bow your heads this morning and let's pray and ask the Lord for his anointing in reading or in ministering the word of God today, all right? Heavenly Father, we are just a blessed, blessed people to be able to be here in the house of God. 
Thank you this morning that we serve a risen Savior, and thank you this morning, Lord, for the word that has been read to our hearts today. I pray that you will just embed it into our spirit. And I ask this morning, Lord, for liberty in the house of God. I pray that you will anoint me and enable me to do what I cannot do on my own. I pray that you will put your thoughts in my mind and your word in my mouth and that you will help me to share what you have placed upon my spirit today. Above all of these things, Lord, I pray that Jesus will be glorified in this place and that the people of God will be edified. I ask you to bless me now that I may be a blessing to those that hear. And we ask all of these things in the mighty name of Jesus and everyone in agreement said amen. Amen. I want to title the message this morning, Revealing the Scars. Revealing the Scars. Our text this morning is a continuation of the resurrection story. Jesus has suffered the cross. The crucifixion is over, and the cross is now behind him. He was buried in a borrowed tomb, and we know now that the grave could not hold him and that he rose from the dead. At this point in the narrative, at this point in the narrative of our text, Jesus is alive. He has conquered death, he has conquered hell, and he has conquered the grave. And he has risen victorious over all things. The apostle Paul would later put it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 54. Death is swallowed up in victory. And then he said, O death, where is thy sting? And O grave, where is thy victory? So now with the cross and the tomb behind him, Jesus sets out to um, reveal himself to his beloved disciples. And both of the texts that we have read this morning and that we have shared together. Both of the texts make it clear that the disciples were locked away, hidden, because they feared what might happen to them. They are locked away, hiding for fear of the Jews. They are fearful that the same fate that Jesus met would meet them as well. So they are hidden away and they are tucked away, locked away, amen, hiding from society and hiding from the spiritual leaders of the day. And the Bible says, in John chapter 20 and verse 19, that it was the same day at evening, being the first day of the week. The doors were shut. The disciples were assembled out of fear. And Jesus comes, (coughs) excuse me, and he appears or he stands in the midst of them and he says, peace be unto you. The first thing that I want you to notice this morning is that Scripture tells us that it was the same day, then the same day. This was Sunday evening, the day of the resurrection. This was the same day that the women had gone to the tomb and they had found the stone rolled away. This is the same day that Mary Magdalene had seen him in the tomb, in the garden tomb, and she thought that he was the gardener. This is the same day that, amen, two of the disciples had come and they had shared with them that they had seen Jesus on the road to Emmaus. This is the same day that Mary Magdalene had went back to the disciples and said, he is alive, I've seen him. And the Bible said that the disciples thought that her story was nothing but idle words and they believed her not. It's the same day that they walked, the two men walked with him on the road to Emmaus. 
And as they walked on the road to Emmaus, Jesus began to open the scriptures unto them and he began to expound upon the the prophets and he began to expound upon the, the suffering of Christ and why that Christ would come and he would suffer and he would be crucified. And the Bible says later in that 24th chapter of the book of Luke that while they walked with him, their hearts burned on the inside of them. Their hearts burned within them. Amen. They didn't realize who they were walking with. The Bible says they didn't recognize who he was. But something on the inside of their spirit, something on the inside of their heart identified with this man that was walking with them. Amen. The Bible says when later when they went in and they began to have uh, dinner, the Bible said that Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And when he did that, their eyes were open and they realized who he was. And the moment that they realized who he was, he disappeared out of their sight. He vanished out of their sight and they were so excited with the news that they had seen the Lord that they got up from the dinner table and they walked all the way back to Jerusalem so that they could tell the other disciples that they had seen the Lord alive all of these events happened on the same day the same day Now imagine in your mind this morning, all of the disciples are locked away and they are hidden for fear of the Jews with the exception of one. Thomas was not there. And they all gathered together in fear, thinking nothing but the worst. And the two that had walked the road to Emmaus and then turned around and walked all the way way back to Jerusalem, they are now reunited with the disciples and they are sharing with them everything that had transpired on the Emmaus road. They said, we were walking down the road. This stranger came up and said, what, 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 what manner of salutations are you having with one? Or what's the conversation about? And they began to tell this stranger that Jesus, who they thought was the Christ, and, and how that he had been crucified. And, and the Bible says that Jesus said to them, oh, you fools and slow of heart to believe. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and then entered into his kingdom? Those men are now gathered with the disciples and they are telling them all about the conversation that they had had with Jesus. How that they had went in to dine with him and how that he took bread and break it and blessed it and when he did, they recognized who he was and how that he literally vanished out of their sight. When was the last time you were sitting at the dinner table and someone literally vanished out of your sight? Been a while, right? What I'm saying is I think it made an impression on them. And they went all the way back and they are now telling all of the other disciples how he had made himself known unto them. And Jesus, as they are speaking, the Bible says in that 36th verse, and as they spake, as they are in the process of telling the others, Jesus appears. The doors are locked and he just simply appears in their midst. And he says to them, peace be unto you. But they were anything but peaceful. They were petrified. How did he get in here? Who is this? What is this? Who is this? Amen. And they were afraid and they supposed that it was a spirit. But Jesus says to them, why are you troubled and why do thoughts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet. See that it is me. Handle me, touch me, amen, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see me have. And the Bible says, and when he had spoken these things unto them, he showed them his hands and his feet. John 20, 20, 
And when he had said these things, he showed unto them his hands and his feet. Now, the thing that I want you to grasp a hold of this morning and that I want to point out, I find it both interesting and I find it thought-provoking. But here is the risen Savior. Here is the risen Lord, the Son of the living God. He has suffered, he has gone through the cross experience, and now he has been resurrected by the power of God. And the thing that he wants them to see is his scars. Makes me wonder why the scars. Think for a moment of the glory and the power that raised Christ from the dead. Such awesome glory and awesome power that the ground literally shook and the stone was removed. Think about the glory and the power that destroyed the grave and rendered death useless. Amen. Think a moment for about the glory and the presence of the angels that said, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Think about the power and the glory that raised Jesus from the dead. There was such tremendous power on a resurrection morning that the earth shook the stone which weighed a mighty, mighty amount. It rolled away and Jesus came forth out of the grave triumphant and victorious over death, hell, and the grave. But still, he bears in his body the scars from the experience. Couldn't God have raised him from the dead and removed the scars? Couldn't God have raised him from the grave without any lasting marks upon his body? Couldn't God have raised him from the tomb, amen, and erased or removed the nail prints in his hand? Couldn't God have, amen, with, with such power and such glory and such majesty that was there, couldn't God have just simply removed the scar in his side and removed the nail prints in his feet? Uh, couldn't God have made his resurrected body free from the reminders of the pain and the suffering that he had endured? And while we can little understand that resurrected body, that Jesus was raised in, the story clearly indicates that he still bore in his body the scars. Surely if God can raise Jesus from the tomb, God could have been able to remove the scars and done some kind of cosmic surgery or some kind of, you know, I mean, cover up. He could have done something to remove them, but God left the scars. God could have removed any lasting impression of the suffering and removed the scars. So why the scars? Why the scars? I submit to you this morning that scars were left as a reminder. The scars were left as a reminder because scars are the nature of, Scars are the nature of healing. Scars are the nature of healing. A wound may heal, but the scar has a story to tell. A wound may heal, but scars testify that something went down. Anybody understand what I'm talking about this morning? A wound may heal, but the scars attest to the fact that there was a battle. The scars testify that there was some form of trauma or some form of pain. The scars, uh, amen, that were there, some, it, it, it testifies that there was some form of injury and some form of brokenness. There was some kind of damage and some kind of discomfort. The scars have a story to tell. 
Scars remind us of the things that we have experienced in our lives. And I submit to you this morning that the scars were left there as a reminder. And when God began to place this uh, message upon my spirit, and I, I will tell you right up front, I preached a message along these lines about eight, seven years ago, something like that. But when God began to deal with my heart this past week, uh, he began to bring me back to this word, amen. And I thought to myself, you know, amen, maybe I have preached this message or something similar to it about seven or eight years ago, but how many of you have had tacos in the last seven years twice? Hello? No, well, I know we have. If it goes on a tortilla, we eat it regularly at my house. But when the Holy Spirit began to put this on my heart, amen, and God began to impress it upon my heart, I began to think about the scars and I began to consider, amen, why the scars were left, amen, and God began to speak to my heart because the scars tell the story. Some of you sitting here this morning have scars. Scars tell a story, amen. And I want you to consider with me this morning three reasons why I believe that God left the scars. First, the scars were a point of proof that he was in fact the same Jesus that had been crucified. Amen, the scars were positive proof of his identity. Amen. When, when they were gathered in that room and Jesus appeared before them, they were afraid and Jesus said, hey, I want you to take a look. It's me. You don't have any reason to be afraid. And he revealed to them his scar. They were positive proof that he was not a figment of their imagination. They were proof that he was not a spirit, that he was not a ghost or from a ghost world, but it was in fact Jesus. They could clearly see, amen, and identify that it was him because of the scars. They saw for themselves the nail prints that were in his hands. They saw for themselves the scar that was in his side they saw the nail prints in his feet and they themselves had stood at the foot of the cross and seen that affliction afflicted upon him and they knew it was him. There was no doubt in their mind. Amen, beloved, they had witnessed the moment that he received those wounds. They, were, they had witnessed the moment that they nailed him to the cross. They had witnessed the moment, amen, when the Roman soldier pierced his side with the sword. The scars were evidence that he was who he said he was. The scars were evidence of the wounds. The scars were evidence of the pain and the suffering. The scars were evidence of the loss and the brokenness. Think about it for a moment, how they must have been feeling that day. The women come from the tomb and said, we have seen the, the risen Lord. We saw him, we thought he was the gardener. And the Bible said they didn't believe the women. You know why? Because in that culture and in that time, amen, they, women were considered to be a second-class citizen and their testimony would not even hold up in a courtroom. So why should the disciples believe Mary when she shows up and says, I've seen the master? No, they didn't believe her. They disregarded what she said. How could they ever believe her story, amen, about seeing the risen Savior when her testimony would not even hold up in court? Perhaps they were in doubt and unbelief. Perhaps they were, amen, in doubts in their minds that, that God had really raised Christ from the dead. But when they saw his scars, it changed everything. It changed everything. All of their doubts disappeared when they saw the scars. All of their disbelief evaporated when they saw the scars. 
their fear vanished when they saw the nail prints in his hand. Their fear vanished when they saw the nail prints in his feet. It was positive proof that he was who he claimed to be. Secondly, the scars, the presence of the scars revealed his great love for them. The Bible says in John 10 and 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd will give his life for the sheep. This was before he went to the cross. John 15 and 13, Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Again, before he went to the Calvary. John 13 and 6, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not be, amen, ashamed. Amen, I'm telling you here this morning, when they saw the scars, their fears vanished. When they saw the scars, they recognized just how much he loved them. Romans chapter five and verse eight, God commended his love. God showed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The scars revealed his love. The scars revealed that the good shepherd had indeed laid down his life for their sin. The scars revealed that the good shepherd had laid down his life so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. He loved us so much, beloved, that he went to Calvary's cross and there he died and he stands in the presence of those disciples with the scars in his body to remind them just how much he loves them. The third thing, those scars remind us that sin has a price. Those scars remind us that sin has a price. Our sin cost Jesus his life. Sin separates us from a holy God, but Jesus laid down his life that we might be reconciled unto God. Paul states in Romans 5 and 19, for by one man's disobedience, by Adam's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, by the obedience of Christ, many shall be made righteous. Sin came into this world because of the disobedience of Adam, amen. And Jesus, the second Adam, came that he might pay the penalty, amen, for our sins and cleanse us and give us freedom in God. His scars reminded them and they should forever remind us that sin has a price and that Jesus paid the ultimate price so that we might be made free and righteous in the sight of our God. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, for he, he God, God the Father, he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. He, Jesus, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. God took our unrighteousness and clothed us with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And his scars are there to remind us just how much he loves us. His scars are there to remind us that sin has great costs. Now, all of these things transpired all of these things happen. Here stands Christ in their midst. They recognize who he is because of his scars. But Thomas was not there. Jesus stands in the midst and he reveals his scars unto them. And the Bible says in our text that when they realized that it was the Lord, they were glad. 
Their hearts were overflowing with joy. But Thomas was not there. Keep in mind, he's not there. The Bible does not tell us where Thomas was, but it clearly states that he was not there. Verse 24 of chapter 20 in the book of John. But Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. And get this. When the other disciples therefore said unto him, Thomas, Thomas, let us tell you what happened when the disciples said unto him, we have seen the Lord. Thomas said, I can't buy that. That's a loose white translation. You, you've been dipping into the funky cider over there. I don't know. He said, except I see his hands and the prints of the nails and I put my finger in the print of the nail, except I take my hand and I thrust it into his side, I will not believe. I will not believe. And when Thomas did return to the rest of them, they're excited to tell him all about it. Said, we've seen the Lord. He said, no, I can't. I can't, that, that, there's no rationale in my mind to believe that. I don't know what y'all had for supper the night you think you saw him. Maybe you had some bad mushrooms or, I don't, I don't know. But I can't buy that. Except, I put my hand in the print of the nails. Thomas couldn't believe their happy ever after ending. He needed some cold, hard evidence. He needed some kind of proof before he could join the others in celebration. And then the Bible tells us in John chapter 20 and verse number 26, and after eight days, again his disciples were within and Thomas, he might have been late to the party, but he was there. And while they are all gathered, including Thomas, Jesus appears and he stand. The doors, the Bible said, the doors being shut, Jesus stood in the midst and he said unto them, peace be unto you. And then he said unto Thomas, reach hither your fingers. And behold my hands, and reach hither your hand and thrust it into my side, and do not be faithless, but believing. And when Thomas saw his scars, the Bible doesn't tell us whether he literally put his hand in the, the side of the Lord or that he stuck his finger in the nail print, but when he saw the scars, He said, my Lord and my God, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen, you have believed, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. He's talking about us. Blessed are those that have not yet seen and yet they believed. When Thomas saw the scars, he was a changed man. He too knew that it was indeed Jesus, and Thomas confessed that Jesus was not just Lord, but he was my Lord and my God. Now, you may be asking yourself this morning, how does all of this apply to us? I want to tell you how it applies to us. Every one of us in this room this morning, every one of us in this room this morning carry some scars. We all carry scars. Maybe they are physical scars. Maybe they are emotional scars. But all of us carry our own personal scars. 
Scars from the pain of broken relationships. Scars from unjust criticism and unfounded accusations. Scars of rejection and exclusion. Scars of tragic loss and grief. Scars from childhood taunts that continue to replay over and over in our minds. Scars of addiction and scars of personal bondage. Scars that were inflicted upon us by others and inflicted upon ourselves. Scars of sin and disobedience and rebellion. We all have scars. But unlike Jesus, many times we are unwilling to reveal our scars. We don't want nobody to see. We don't want nobody to know where we were injured. Most of the time we do our best to cover up our old injuries and we cover up even our scars so that nobody sees and so that nobody knows. We protect ourselves from revealing too much. We, re, uh, we protect ourselves from revealing the pain that was associated with the wounded areas of our life and we try to pretend that it doesn't exist and that it never happened. I got news for you this morning. Every single one of us sitting here in this house have some scars. And I don't mean to sound unkind toward the church, but often we put on a brave face and act like nothing ever happened because we don't want anybody to see our scars. We act like we ain't ever had any trouble, like we've never suffered any hardships, like we've never had our heart broken. We act like, uh, amen, we ain't got any scars because we've never been hurt. Can I tell you this morning, that is Oscar Mayer theology. That is baloney. We've all been injured. We've all injured ourselves. We all have scars. But what if we took a biblical look at our scars? Jesus voluntarily showed his scars to the disciples. It was part of how he shared himself with others. His scars were part of of his story. His scars were a result of what he had suffered on our behalf. And if you are a student of the Bible, then you know that he will carry those scars in his body throughout eternity. Those scars are always going to be a part of who he is. In showing the disciples his scars, Jesus was saying to them two things. Number one, remember all that happened. Remember the pain. Remember the suffering. Remember the anguish. Remember the sacrifice. Remember that I did all of these things out of love for you. And secondly, he was saying, the wounds that you saw that were afflicted upon me, they are healed and they exist no more. His scars proved that his suffering was complete. His scars proved that the wounds had closed. His scars proved that through the resurrection, the wounds and the pain and the suffering and the death had been closed off and healed. The presence of the scars showed that the work of Christ had been finished and that he had been healed of everything, including his own mortality. Thomas believed only because he saw the scars. But Thomas only saw the scars because Jesus was willing to reveal them to him. You understand what I'm saying this morning? Beloved, there are those like Thomas who are among us in our daily lives. And they refuse to uh, receive Christ. They've heard of Jesus, but they refuse to believe. Like Thomas, they need some cold, hard evidence. 
Well, what if the church, what if you and I were a little more willing to reveal our wounded places and, 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 and reveal the scars so that they could see how Christ has healed and made us whole? What if instead of hiding our scars, we could be more like Jesus and openly share the healed places of our life? What if we would get real with the world and get real with people? What if we stop hiding our scars and let them see the areas of our life that Christ brought healing? What if our scars could be a reminder that injuries heal? What if our scars could be a reminder, amen, that failure is not fatal? What if our scars... Amen, could be a reminder to others uh, that it is only by the grace and the goodness of God that we overcame. One of our scars could point to the healing power of Christ. One of our scars could testify. One of our scars could testify that God is still willing to use broken things. One of our scars could testify that we are the people of the resurrection. What if our scars could testify that we've been wounded and yet by God's healing grace and God's healing power we still walk on? What if our scars were not just a reminder of our weakness, but what if they were a reminder of God's resurrection power in our own life? God still uses broken things, including our scars. God uses broken soil to produce a crop. Broken clouds to produce rain. Broken grain to give bread. Bread to give strength. It is the alabaster box that is shattered that allows the sweet perfume to escape. What if, what if we just got real with others and revealed our scars? I'm preaching to the choir. I'm preaching to me when the Lord put it on my heart. I'm like, yeah, Gary, you need to get real. Yeah, Gary, you need to just be more open about that. I had a dream. For those of you that don't know, you can tell by looking at the left side of my face that something happened. Well, I went to a regular dental checkup. The dentist said, we need to keep an eye on a spot inside your mouth. I'm not sure what's going on there. Next time I went, they said, you need to go have a biopsy and have that checked out. Turned out to be cancer. And they wanted to do a surgery and radiation and all of that kind of thing. I've shared some of that testimony with many of you. Here not long ago, I had a dream. And in my dream... There was a very sweet individual. I was telling them in my dream about all of the different miracles that I've seen God do down through 36, 37 years of ministry. And I was telling them about some of the healings that God had, I've seen the Lord do. And, and that person gently put their hand on my face and said, shall we pray and ask God to help whatever's going on here. And I said to that individual in my dream, oh, <laughs> I am completely healed. That's just a scar from the battle. That's just a scar from the fight. Who helped me overcome? It wasn't my strength. It wasn't my power. It was the strength and the power of an awesome God that I serve. I went 15 rounds with the enemy and came out on top because God was on my side. I went 15 rounds with the enemy and came out on top because greater is he that is in me than he that is within the world. 
Amen. I'm telling you here this morning, you got some scars that might help somebody along the way and help them to recognize that the same God that pulled you through is the same God that can pull them through. Life is a battle. My daddy used to say these words. He said, life is wonderful if you don't weaken. I'm telling you here this morning, some of us have some scars and we try to hide and we try to cover those up. We try to keep them to ourselves. But in reality, they are a testimony of God's grace and God's mercy and God's power. Don't be afraid to reveal your broken scars. Don't be afraid. Amen. Maybe by revealing our scars, we could be able to comfort someone who's going through a similar experience. Maybe our scars, amen, maybe we can uh, learn from the things that we went through and find a whole other level of compassion and patience for those who are going through some of the same things themselves. Maybe we don't even know it, but maybe we have become a source of strength to others who know our story and they've wondered how that we made it through. I can tell you how you can make it through. Only by leaning on him. That's it. What I'm saying this morning is don't be afraid to allow your scars to be part of your testimony because it's through the scars that we just might cause others to believe. It's through the scars, amen, and because the scars and because of our testimony that others may see the saving grace of our God. You may have fought a battle and you may have some scars to show it. But if you stand in the presence of the Lord and your heart is right with God, I'm telling you this morning that the healed places that were wounded, the healed places can be a testimony to someone else. Bow your heads, please. Don't be afraid to share your scars with others. Because our scars are living proof of his healing power. Our scars are living proof of his healing power. I don't know everything that everyone here has gone through. But what I can tell you just simply by living life for as long as I have. All of us have some scars physical, emotional, mental. All of us have some scars. Don't be afraid to share your testimony. Don't be afraid to let others know the fight that you went through. Don't let, don't let fear grip your heart and cause you to just keep it in and keep it to yourself. Or like me, just, you know, be such a private person that you really don't want to share your business with somebody else. What we go through testifies. It is proof of God's grace. Our scars are proof of his healing. Our scars are proof of his love. Our scars are proof of the resurrection power of God. Your scars just may bring joy and comfort to someone else as it did the disciples. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, in the name of Jesus this morning, I have endeavored to deliver to these folks what I feel like you placed on my heart. And now, Heavenly Father, I just have to leave it to the Holy Spirit to speak to us and empower what has been said. 
touch our hearts with our with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Touch our hearts with your presence. Touch our hearts with the reassurance that our scars are a testimony of your grace. And let us be willing to be more open, honest, that others may see what you have done in our hearts and in our lives. In Jesus' name, every head bowed, every eyes closed. Maybe you're here this morning and you would be willing to just slip up your hand and say, Preacher, I needed to hear this word today. Thank you for sharing what God put on your heart. God bless hands that are being lifted here and there and there and there. There, there. Your testimony has power. None of us have lived, none of us have lived a perfect life. We all have scars. Those healed places in your life are a testimony of God's goodness, of God's mercy and God's grace. Stand to your feet all over the building this morning. Lift up your hands to the Lord in worship. They're going to come and sing one more time. As we stand here before the Lord this morning, I ask you to just call upon the name of the Lord and say, Lord, help me to share my testimony so that others may see your goodness and your grace and recognize that you could do the same in their hearts and in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Come and sit. the only 